As a human embryo is developing inside of its mother, I don't want you to think that its head is growing and expanding like a balloon is inflating as much as tissues are wrapping around, meeting, and forming the face, if that makes sense. And th where they meet occurs in a few different locations. And if there's a failure point in that meeting, that fusion process, or multiple failure points, you can end up with what's called an orofacial cleft. And that's like a cleft lip or a cleft palate. So if we take a look at the body donor here, so this is a mid-sagittal section of the human head, we can see part of the frontal bone as it's transitioning into the nasal septum. This divides the left and right aspects of the nasal cavity. And then we can see the palate. The palate is gonna be obviously a big focus of our attention here today, so we'll come back to this in a second. We can also see the upper lip, then we can see the lower lip, we can see the mandible, and we can see the tongue. Now it's important to note that this donor does not have teeth, but the teeth would be projecting and coming out from these aspects of the mandible and the maxilla bone. But what we're saying here, an oral facial cleft would occur in this region here, because this, between the upper lip, as it extends all the way back to the soft palate, this is where all the tissues are gonna to meet together. Now these tissues all arise from what are called the germ layers. Now we're not gonna to get too detailed into the germ layers, just understand that everything that forms the human body comes from three sheets of tissue. And at around week four, these sheets fold on themselves. This is week four of gestation. They fold on themselves and form this kind of like shrimp, tadpole looking thing that we call and recognize as the embryo. And if we were to look at the head aspect of that, you would find what are called, these are, it's kind of wordy, but there's two masses of tissue here that we need to understand. And the first is called the frontonasal prominence. The frontonasal prominence creates the central core of your face. So it creates part of your forehead or that frontal bone. It creates the nasal cavity. It creates the nasal septum. And then it's gonna wrap around and create the middle part of your upper lip as well as this aspect here. If you look really closely, look really closely, hopefully you can see this. There's like this little hole here. This is called the incisive foramen. This is a location where blood vessels and nerves are gonna be exiting um, that are gonna be supplying a variety of tissues in the oral cavity. But just in front of this, this is what we call the primary palate. The primary palate, as well as the middle part of your upper lip. If you look, you can't probably see this all that well with my facial hair, but there's an indentation just below the nose as it meets the upper lip, that is called the philtrum. The philtrum is vestigial, meaning it's a leftover of evolution. In other mammals, such as dogs, it actually serves a function of assisting in them smelling. It doesn't work like that for you. Instead, it's just this characteristic thing that we can all recognize. But the philtrum, so if we go back here, so we have that primary palate, the philtrum, and that middle portion of the upper lip, and then all of this going all the way up to the forehead is going to come from that frontonasal prominence. But then you also have what's called the pharyngeal apparatus. This is going back to around week four of embryonic development. And the pharyngeal apparatus is what wraps around to create, and we'll go back to the donor here, it's gonna create the tongue, the mandible, the lower lip, and then the lateral aspects of the upper lip. Right? So what's gonna happen is the upper lip is coming around like this and it's gonna meet that frontonasal prominence is coming down the center. So they're gonna actually meet and connect right there in the middle. But it's also going to create the rest of the hard palate. So again, if we come to that incisive foramen, this aspect of bone here is the rest of the hard palate and then it's also gonna create the soft palate. So you have multiple tissues wrapping around to meet here at the upper lip and at the palate. And I'm sure you can now understand why if we have a failure in these points, that can create that orofacial cleft. So let's now go ahead and discuss cleft palates specifically because they can actually manifest in about three different ways. So if you recall, this spot here is called the incisive foramen and just in front of it is that primary palate. Then behind it is the secondary palate. You could have a cleft in either of those or you could have a cleft in a combination of them. But how those clefts appear or manifest is gonna happen differently. So for instance, if you have a cleft in the primary palate, that's a failure in the fusion of the frontonasal prominence meeting that pharyngeal apparatus. Now that could be the same thing here. 
because as you can see, right, you have the pharyngeal apparatus is responsible for that secondary palate, and maybe it doesn't quite meet up with the primary palate, so you could have a cleft here. But another option is that, well, I guess the best way to describe it is we have to describe how the tongue develops. So the tongue doesn't actually develop all the way down here. Instead, it develops higher up and then descends. So if you picture like this, this is the tongue, and then on either side, you have the secondary palate. And so they're all on the same plane. And then the tongue will descend into the oral cavity and the secondary palate will come over and then form the roof of the mouth. But if it doesn't quite make it over, you now have a cleft. And that is another option. So another way that you can have that cleft is that that pharyngeal apparatus on either side is not meeting up with itself. And that can extend all the way back into the soft palate, which could be a problem for ear infections. You see this little hole here? This is the entrance to the pharyngotympanic tube, which connects to your middle ear. And the same musculature, the pharyngeal muscles that help open and close that, are gonna play a part in closing off the nasopharynx with this soft palate. So if this is not properly developed, this could be open in ways that could make it more susceptible for ear infections. But we also then have to think, well, if you have a hole in this palate, you have an abnormal connection between the nasal cavity and oral cavity. And that could mean food and drink could get in here, which this is not you know, meant to digest or process those things, which could create another infection. But then you have to think you could have breathing problems because air, if you're breathing through the nose, is supposed to go through the nasal cavity and then down. But if all of a sudden it's coming through here, that's another issue. Or breathing this way. And then especially if you're an infant, right? Think like a newborn. A newborn is going to have feeding problems because if they're trying to nurse from their mother, the milk could go up here or they might just not be able to create enough suction force because everything's compromised, which means parents are going to need feeding assistance with their newborns if they have a cleft palate. And again, this can be more severe, right? So it's like this is a more of a minor cleft palate, but that's still a significant issue. But what if you had a combination of both and it extends all the way back here? You're then gonna have to have multiple surgeries to fix this entire process. And that's not even including a cleft lip, right? So if we go back to this philtrum, a cleft lip on the other hand, that is a failure where that pharyngeal apparatus coming on either side is failing to meet up with that frontonasal prominence. And here's the thing, it could happen on one side. So let's say like my left upper lip meets properly, but my right doesn't. I now have what's called a unilateral cleft. It's only happening on one side. But I could also have a bilateral cleft where there's a failure in the fusion point on both sides. And here's the thing, that can extend all the way back, right? You could have a cleft lip that translates into a cleft palate and could even go all the way back. There are some individuals that it happens in the cleft lip, the primary palate, and the secondary palate on both sides. That's obviously gonna require multiple surgeries and is gonna be much more expensive than it would be to treat, say, just a cleft lip. In treatments, there's a variety of different surgical procedures, but I should say that they happen at different times. So if you're having a cleft palate uh, repair, they usually will target that between six and 12 months to fix the issue here. But if you have a cleft lip, they'll usually target that around three months. So if you have both, you're going to have to have multiple surgeries in order to do that at different timelines. And those surgeries could be more extensive or more limited depending on what's actually affected. Now, to my understanding, you know, cleft palates or rather oral facial clefts in general are one of the most common birth defects in the human species. They happen in about one in every 700 births worldwide, although they do affect certain populations more than others, such as Asian populations and Native American populations. But they cost around $100,000 in lifetime treating cost, at least in the United States. That's pretty expensive, right? That includes prenatal and postnatal care, as well as possible speech therapy and all sorts of things that can come from outside of that, right? If you aren't able to fix it within those timelines, speech problems can occur, breathing problems, digestive problems, infections, all sorts of things that can even be life-threatening can occur, which is why having access to modern medical care is so important when treating these types of conditions. But $100,000 is pretty expensive. But hopefully that gives you an understanding of everything that's going on in this complex dance of tissues forming the face. If you're someone who enjoys short yet information-dense lessons like this, then you're gonna absolutely love the sponsor of today's video, Brilliant.
Brilliant is an online learning platform for STEM subjects, that is math, science, and computer science. They have thousands of lessons and are adding more every single month. Brilliant is fun, interactive, and they have lessons for whatever your skill level may be. Right now I'm doing a deep dive into computer science and specifically large language models. I'm completely obsessed with artificial intelligence, right? I'm, I'm that person who is just constantly talking about AI and everyone else is like, you need to stop. You need to stop, but I'm not gonna stop. And that's because I find this so incredibly interesting. The problem is that I have zero background in computer science. I've never taken a computer science class in my entire lifetime. I'm a millennial, so I know how to interact with technology. I just have no idea how it works. Sometimes I'm confused as to what software is and isn't. But all I know is that Brilliant has been amazing in teaching me what's going on underneath the hood of these large language models like ChatGPT, BARD, and other models. If you're interested, go to brilliant.org slash IHA to start a free 30-day trial and they'll also get the first 200 people there 20% off their annual subscription. You can go ahead and find that link in the description below. Thanks for hanging out with me in this video and I'll see you in the next one.